see, we're busy with the book of Acts. Acts is appropriately named. It's not, you know, this passive understanding of Christianity that I think sometimes tames us into some kind of lukewarm expression of something that cannot be contained and is vibrant and full of excitement and energy. It's, it's often our expressions that make it like that. But I want to challenge us to action because book, the book of Acts is action. It's the best understanding of what, when Jesus said to the disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, this is our best understanding. And, and you know, interpretation of Scripture says that if God did that then, He's going to continue to do it today. And it's only through the attack of the enemies, through the ages, the dark ages, the church going into absolute religious death and destruction. And thank God, he's still committed to doing what he did in the book of Acts. Why? Because revivals and reformations and renewals and all of this took place. And, you know, they found the word of God. If you've ever read through the book of Kings, one of the points of revival, they found the word. They said, what's this book? Because all the kings before them had just ignored the word. So some guy in cleaning up the temple, because he was a good king, he says to him, we found this book. They read it and they weep because they understand the will of God. And they say, would you forgive us? And suddenly worships back in the, in the church. It's the same. In our history, this word, this vibrant, life-giving word, this will of God, kind of was hidden away, and only priests were allowed to even comment on it. It wasn't available to us. We couldn't read it. We couldn't understand what God is saying to us. And God said, okay, I'll sort that out. And he did, through reformations and revivals and the inventing of the printing press and people who translated the scriptures. And now we have the word, and the word sets us free. So I'm building us up to the fact that Every time we read the Word of God should be a time for worship and, and a time to say, Spirit of God, what are you saying to me? Because the Word brings revival, renewal, refreshing, and so on. And so our theme, as we've kind of said, as we're working through the book of Acts, which is what Acts is, the Spirit of God is poured out when Christ has been ascended, and now He's very will and purpose that he prophesied would take place is going to take place until the return of Jesus. Through every generation, those that are going to open themselves up to the anointing of his Holy Spirit, we will partner, partner together with the Spirit of God, like we see in the book of Acts, to see God's will accomplished. And we have another chapter now dealing with this, Christ building his church. Um, there was a time in the history of Cornerstone um, I'd kind of driven past Rose Deep Squatter Camp on a number of occasions, and it just broke my heart to see so many people. One night in a dream, I kind of could see us here, the Kopi Ridge, and then across there, Rose Deep. And I felt God saying to me, what you have, I want them to have. So I, I parked my car across the road from that little hotel where that I don't know, that incredibly lovely bit of sculpture is over there. I still don't know what it is. <laughs> and I went to find the chairman of the squatter camp, and I found him, introduced myself. There's a chairman, and there was a secretary of the squatter camp. And uh, I asked if we could just use some land, and he welcomed me. And every month we would go to go and do outreach. You remember that, Elaine? And uh, it was interesting to see the liberty by the spirit of what took place. Eventually a church was planted there and from there churches were planted in other areas as well. Yes, the will of God. He looks at those who have and he wants to join with those who haven't got so that they can be free as well. You know that. During that time, we had a few, in those days there weren't emails, we had a few mails coming in of saying, how could we go to where there are Thieves and murderers and rapists and all of this. My heart broke because God was beginning to change the way we saw our city. And I tell you, we need to continue to do that. 
So this chapter is about God looking at Jerusalem who have the riches of the kingdom and looking at the Gentiles and saying, I want them to have what Jerusalem have. But of course, already Jerusalem have said, you know, we're going to keep it. <laughs> Remember, they had to be persecuted for the gospel to go out because they were trying to trap it in what? Nation, their, their kind of culture, their language, and their religious system. And, and I tell you, if there's any lesson we're going to learn from this passage, it's this. God is committed to taking this word of liberty from those who know it to those who don't know it, and he wants to anoint us for this, and will we open our ears and hearts to hear what he's saying? Because every one of us has a part to play when it comes to this. Every one of us. And so it's got to go from kind of my comfort and, and my place of safety, and I've got to take it to where God wants it. And that's why we, are, you know, often you, people say, well, you know, you guys, I've had folk tell me we are leaving this church because it's not about us. It's always about going. It's always about this gospel. It's always about the next place we're going to go and open up a site. Yes, I tell you, my heart breaks when people do that. It really does. Because this is why we exist, is to see the gospel go out. And we will continue to do that. The city has 10, I don't know how many million, 10 unofficially, or who knows how many. But we have a mandate to reach the city, and we have a mandate to reach the world. And there are people groups all over the place. And I kind of see the Spirit of God saying, Cornerstone is rich. Cornerstone has this incredible liberty, and I'm calling you to go. And I think if we can get that into our hearts first, we'll become less like survivors and victims of life. Because often we try and get to a place where, okay, once my debt's paid, once I feel stronger, once I've done this, once I've had my kids, once I've done that, then I'll go or then I'll do or then I'll accomplish or whatever. No, now, right now. Right now, God is challenging our status quo. So let's read the story of about two very interesting characters, Peter and Cornelius. Peter, the apostle, the fiery apostle, um, that God now is using in an amazing way to preach and see people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Acts chapter two, Acts chapter three, uh, thousands of people are coming to know the Lord. And Peter's out, we've heard it already on ministry. And then Cornelius is a centurion, he's a Roman soldier, and but like the one that Jesus connected with, he's devout. There's something about him, the word has gripped him, even though it's the Old Testament, but it's gripped him. And so we're gonna see how God takes these two characters and puts them together. And because of that, the gospel goes to the Gentiles, and you and I today are very glad because of that moment, <laughs> because we have the gospel. It's interesting, eh? Those who pioneered in other places, people are sitting there now in Paul, de Paro, and glad that Valdu and Annika went there because they're now born again. Isn't that amazing how God works that? Do you know that this church, kind of think of all those that have gone out, we would be way stronger if they were here. But we are way more strong because they've gone. Because out there are all these kind of uh, headways or whatever it is for the gospel. So let's read. If you have a Bible on your iPad, your iPhone, good. It's going to come up here for those who have left their Bibles behind. But what we're going to do is read the whole chapter and let it speak to us. But better if you read it as I talk because it'll make way more sense to you. And it's an encouragement for us. Every single one of us that is here to make reading a regular part of our lives. So here we go, chapter 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, Italian group, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Notice the words, devout, feared God, prayed continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision, that's three in the afternoon, an angel of God come in and say to him, 
Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your arms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who's called Peter. He's lodging with one Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. That's not a guy that lies in the sun a lot. That's to do with leather. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants uh, and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa, an important delegation of people. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. That's 12 noon. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by, it, by its four corners upon the earth. Uh, in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, him as well, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Did you notice that? Vegetarian. Oh, well, let's not go down there. <laughs> he didn't say plant and pluck. He said kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. You see, Yah begins the process of loosening his bias. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times. You know, three times, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, is a kind of declaration that irrefutably so, God is holy from Isaiah. And three times in the Bible is God's getting your attention and saying, this thing must happen. This is my will. And the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed, I want you to follow the emotions, something, the transformation that's going on in Peter. He was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean. Of course, he's hungry. Does that mean I go out there and, you know, kill it, you know, a lizard and start eating it, which was unclean to the Jews? What did this mean? And then, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. Isn't that amazing? The timing, spirit-led, there was no ways God was going to let this opportunity uh, kind of be missed. This was a God-ordained set of circumstances. And while Peter was pondering the vision, so he was perplexed, he was pondering, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them into his, uh, to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. So there we have Cornelius' group. We have Peter with a couple of Jews. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. I love that. Called as many as he could out of friends and relatives and his staff and his household. Then Peter entered. Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up and said, no, stand up. I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. They would know because they were now, he was a devout man. He knew all about this. But God has shown me. Isn't that interesting, hey? God showed him the vision three times. He pondered this. He was perplexed. But God has shown me. God has shown me. For, what verse was I in? What? 28. Yes, my eyes are shut. I can't see. Okay. You yourselves know how awful it is for a Jew, but God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then, 
why you sent for me. Isn't that interesting? So always clear that up. The conversation you're having with somebody, why do you want, you, you see, obviously, they don't know. So there must, obviously it's going to be an opportunity for the gospel, but he asks. And Cornelius said four days ago about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your arms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who's called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon and Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. What an opportunity. Now I want to suggest where our hearts are in that place of knowing that we have what those who don't have need, these kind of opportunities are going to show themselves. And I've seen that happen in my own life at times. And it's like the Spirit of God has prepared that people. And I have this wonderful opportunity of sharing with them. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. Lesson learned. But in every nation, I wonder if we've learned that. God shows no partiality. In other words, we should be like that. No partiality, nothing. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. And here's the summary of Christ's ministry. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power he sent about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And that's exactly what we've been called to do. And we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. I'll just pause there until somebody says, that is awesome. <coughs> you see, he's not dead. He did die. But he was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead so that we can have that new life. Not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he's the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. Everyone, not you only. Remember in the book of Joel, it says in those days, the last days, the days we're living in, the Spirit of God will be poured out and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Just think right now, there are people you're going to be talking to and you're going to be able to explain this to them. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised, those are the Jews, who had come with Peter, were amazed. You see, God is amazing because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. How did they know that the Spirit was poured out? And sometimes our conservative natures or somebody put some kind of stupid thought in our head about the Holy Spirit. Now there's evidence when the Holy Spirit comes and he falls on us, there's evidence. Lives change, things happen, and this is one of the most common things they heard them speaking in other tongues. That's not Pentecostal, that's biblical. And often we think, well, that's for the Pentecostals. It's biblical. They spoke in tongues. The Spirit of God has come to them, and they were extolling God. You see, when the Spirit comes on me, that's what's going to happen and I'm going to be praising God. And that's why I trust Him for a fresh anointing every day. Why I want to speak heaven's language as I pray. And I want to praise God all day. I don't want to live this life in my strength. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him, to remain for some days. Wouldn't you? <laughs> Don't go. There's a lot of stuff you've got to explain over here. That jabba, jabba, jabba that came out of their mouths. What is that? 
He had wonderful opportunity through this to teach and to guide them and to show them and assure them of their salvation. That's what it's about. But notice, all of this is not an outreach program. It's a heart. And it's me saying, I am not going to hold this back. I am not going to be a dead end. Lord, use me to reach anyone that you want to. I want to go over the copy to the next group of people. I want to even be challenged and go to another people group. Even this very difficult thing, it's go from your house to the house next door. Most scary thing on the planet is to go to the neighbor. But guess what? Pray. God will give us an opportunity. Somehow. And that should be our daily mission, is living our lives with that kind of purpose. And so here we have two devout men, one a Jew, one a Gentile. The Gentile, there's a big debate, you know, was the Gentile saved? Was Cornelius saved? Well, according to Scripture in the New Testament, no. But according to the way he was living his life, he loved God. He just needed the truth to be set free. It's the same as those when Paul arrives in Ephesus, he meets these 12 disciples. Notice even Cornelius' disciple, those, called, those were called disciples. In other words, there was something of God in them. And then Paul says to these 12 at Ephesus, have you been baptized with the Spirit? No, we haven't even heard. We've only been baptized in John's baptism. And so there was a whole lot of teaching that needed to take place and bring them to a right understanding of salvation. God heard Cornelius' prayers. Isn't that an encouragement to us? That God honors giving alms. That's gifts to the poor. God's heart is for the poor. And I don't mean that through giving to the poor and through praying, you know, that's kind of earning us bonus points. Not at all. It's the heart showing the same compassion that Christ shows God wants that of us. And there are none as poor as those that don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we get given that incredible privilege to be able to share with them. Man, there is nothing more important than that. So God hears this man. I love his heart. I love his attitude. You know, Italian cohorts, like this Italian band, Italian group uh, that kind of hang out together. You know, it's like, probably an Italian club like the one down the road. It's, that's what it is. He's in charge. He's the centurion. He's the boss. You know, and he's got friends who are running around him. He knows like the centurion that Jesus ministered to. People go and people come under his command. He knows what it's about. But this devout man has witnessed to them already, even in his Old Testament understanding of Christianity. He wants to influence in the right way. He's hooked into something that he says, I know this is right. Because even through that Old Testament understanding, he had come to know the goodness of God. So God says, I'm going to answer those prayers. So I remember getting an invite. We were working with a guy in Rustenburg, and kind of, he has a massive printing press, and he felt from God to print Bibles for every single kind of language that doesn't have Bibles or a lot of them. And he would use thousands and hundreds of thousands of rand, bought two big trucks, overland trucks, and he takes them out. So we worked with him for a while. Glenn got quite involved with him. But we had an incredible visit to a farmer who reminded me of, sin, of the centurion. And this farmer had, was an unbeliever. Uh, he actually showed me around his house. He had every buck's horns on his wall, everyone. Uh, he was a hunter of note. He had alles geskit. Everything, and then he said, come, I'll show you. And we went downstairs, and there was black rhino, white rhino horn, <laughs> tusks. And he said, say nooks, say nooks. I said, okay, I'll take nothing. We'll just leave it as that. But you know, he had, uh, with this guy in, in Rustenburg, this pastor, he'd got born again through being healed of cancer. God had healed him. And you know what he did is he put a tent up on his property, and he invited all his friends and his family, like Cornelius, and he said, everybody, come. And then this guy preached the gospel and people got saved that day. You know, so real was this O-Topi, this O-Farmer's testimony. And so gripped was he with this, I've got to let people know, on one of the hunting farms that he has, there's a whole uh, blind community. He went and bought Braille Bibles, a bucky load, and took it to them. 
And he said, now we're going to pray and ask God to come into your hearts and you're going to have the Bible to read. That was the first time they ever had anything to read. That was so awesome. And just to see the transformation in his life. For me, this is Cornelius wanting to do good. And so God answers those prayers. The gospel goes to them. Thank God for that kind of transformation. And you can see how spirit-led this whole process was to ensure that there would be no hindrances on the way. And there was amazement. There was signs and wonders and all of this. And I say, thank God for that. So what can we learn from this, from Peter and Cornelius? Our theme is still this, that Jesus is building his church. Committed to it, even though it's been 2,000 years of ups and downs, right now, as when he said it in, in Matthew chapter 16, he hasn't stopped, and as he looks at each one of us, he's doing exactly that. He's building his church. So God responds to devotion, generosity, prayer, and faith. We need to understand that. It, you know, generosity doesn't save us, but generosity, we share the same heart as God. So God responds to that. So I want to encourage you, don't stop, keep going. I want to encourage you that the gospel wants to and does cross every boundary of culture and nationality. And think, think of those areas that need the gospel still. And let's pray and let's trust God for them. And then for me, God is not content to leave his faithful disciples without a full experience of salvation, including water baptism and being filled with the Spirit. So we can't say, I'm just a, a salvation Christian. The water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism is for someone else. Notice what God does with each group, including Philip in Samaria. And yeah, we have Peter with the uh, Gentiles. God wants to save you. God wants you to be baptized. And he wants to fill you with the Spirit. That's God's plan for our lives. And so today, if you're not baptized with water, you need to be baptized in water. You, you identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's a public declara declaration of your, your faith in Christ. So the only precondition is you need to be born again. And so we are going to have one. And apparently we have a new heater system there or an old one that's been fixed. That's a false promise anyway. <laughs> but here's the deal. It's not about water temperature. It's about there's water. Wayne is going to be going to do it. There are towels. Thank God for that. And there's stuff that you can wear. So if you would like to be baptized in water, and those that have already been uh, uh, prepared for themselves, if you don't mind going out, uh, we're going to have the baptism in a few minutes. Let's give them an applause. Not Glenn. Glenn's been baptized. Ella, Ella, Ella. <laughs> so out of those who have been born again here this morning, that's the first step of obedience. We don't wait months and years and kind of debate. We follow through. So if you want to be baptized, all those young ladies that are here, as long as you have parental permission, <laughs> because that's, if you're still at home and you have parents, it's important. But if you're sitting there and you've been born again, you're not baptized in water, why? Okay, there we go, another one. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just joking. Don't stand up now because I think you're going to go and get baptized. <laughs> so if you would like to be baptized, please do that. And then we will also, at the end of this meeting, pray with you to be filled with the Spirit because that's what God wants to do. So he wants to fill you with the Spirit. And then lastly, for me, the lesson that we learned from all of this is God wants to lead every single one of us to have experiences like Peter so that we'd have our own testimony of how this gospel transcends me and my world into the life and the circumstances of others. Let's